But I want to talk to you today out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we started our Bible studies back this past Wednesday night, and the study has a lot to do with how do we live the Christian life. I'm going to ask you three questions, and we dealt with this Wednesday night at the Foster's home. But one of the things in our Christian life is how do we live it? Do we look around and see how others live it? Do we compare ourselves to other people? Do we uh, look at how this group or that group, how they do it, what they proclaim, and those sorts of things? How is the Christian life lived? There are three questions that are associated with it that as we go through our Bible study that I want us, that we're going to really uh, talk about, we're going to weave in and weave out each week. Uh, the title of the, the Bible study is simply Good Stuff to Know. I couldn't come up with a better creative way to say it. It's just good stuff to know, and we need to know these things because if we don't know it, if we don't understand how we live by the Spirit, then uh, we can get really confused and really have a difficult time in our walk with the Lord. But here are the three questions that I asked at the Fosters and we'll deal with this coming Thursday at the Caves. First one is, was your faith life once vibrant and alive, but now it just feels like a, a lifeless treadmill and you can't find the off switch? You know, there's so many Christians who are going through the motions, they're, they're doing their religious activity all the time, and it seems like all they do is uh, activity. There's no vibrancy to it. There's just stuff. It's just continually working and working and working. There's no life to it. There's no vibrancy to it. There's no joy to it. It's just, this is what I have to do. It's really doing what they do out of a sense of duty. The second one is, do you struggle with feelings of guilt because you can't seem to go deeper in your relationship with Christ? It's as if every time you try to go deeper in that relationship, it's like you've got your shovel and you're hitting rock. And if you've ever dug in your yard and you've hit rock, it's just impossible, right? It just frustrates you over time and you generally will give up because you can't get through it. So what is it in our relationship with Christ? One, the desire that wants us to, to, to go deeper. And then secondly, what is it about our relationship with Christ that impedes that or keeps that? Or is it any, or is there anything, and maybe it's just something that we have put in our own minds that is a barrier rather than the Lord's uh, putting up a barrier for us. Then the third question is, do, do you sometimes question your salvation because you've tried all the formulas and yet you still feel like a spiritual loser? You feel like I'm getting nowhere in this spiritual life. I can't do it. I, everything I've tried doesn't work. I've tried the five steps to this, the seven steps to that, the three steps to this. But everything I do, everything that the people tell me to do, it doesn't work. So there's something wrong with me. Maybe God doesn't really love me. Maybe he loves me, but he's just going to let me stay where I'm at. I have nothing else I can do. And so these questions are really in the negative, right? I mean, they, they put everything in the, in the negative. But what I want to do today is, as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, is to turn it to the positive. Paul is going to answer some of these questions. He's going to get at the heart of our Christian life, of how we live each day in Christ. And so the positive part is, it's in the, it's in the title, really, that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. If you want to answer each of these three questions in the positive, you have to go to the Spirit of the living God who lives with inside of you. And so what I want to do is read 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stone came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently on the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what has glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. 
For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intensely at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day of the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now there are three things I want to emphasize here about what Paul is trying to say and what he is actually saying. He first of all starts out by saying he needed no letter of commendation. What was happening in Corinth was that there were these false teachers coming in and they were coming in and they were denying Paul's authority. They were saying what he was teaching was not right. They denied his authority and they slandered his name. And they were coming with these forged letters, if you will, these document, this documentation saying Paul is not who he claimed to be. We come with the real truth. We've got the real message for, for you, not Paul. And so Paul says, look, I don't need a letter of authentic, authenticity. I don't need to authenticate my ministry with you because you know what I taught you. My letter of, of, of my credentials are written on our hearts for you, by you, from you, because we have come to, we came to you and we taught the clarity and the purity and the simplicity of the gospel. We came and taught this. We didn't teach you what they're teaching you. We didn't try to combine things that don't need to be com combined. In fact, what Paul declared to them was this whole understanding of the new covenant. And he'll, he'll look at that in just a moment, moment and we'll talk about it. But one of the things that happened in Corinth was much like Galatians. You remember in Galatians, one of the issues was, do we live by the law or do we live by faith? And even Peter got distracted and he became a hypocrite. And Paul confronted him because he was eating with the Gentiles until the Jews came. Then when the Jews came, he, he uh, took his leave from the Gentiles and only sat with the Jews. And by his actions, he was saying, we have to have the law in order to live as believers in Jesus Christ. We have the Spirit, but we have to have the law as well. We have to have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We have to live by both. And Paul is saying that that is not the case at all. That is not true. And in fact, those who are teaching that to, us, to you, they're leading you astray and don't listen to them. If you need a letter of authentication, then just look in your hearts at what I've taught you. Listen to what I said. Read the first letter. Listen to the things that I've taught you. Then you will know. It is the Spirit of the living God who gives life. And that's what he was trying to say. It's not letters on stone. Letters on stone couldn't do it. And he reminds them, again, that their adequacy, or their, their inadequate in and of themselves. Just like we recognize in and of ourselves, we are inadequate. But with the Spirit of God living in us, we are now adequate to do whatever God desires for us to do. Now you might think, why is Paul talking about this whole idea of, of these false teachers? And then he talks about adequacy. And then he's about to talk about the New and Old Covenant. Why would he even bring that up? Well, I think that Paul is trying to get at the, the point that under the law, it's about what you do. It's about the 613 rules and regulations that you have to keep. Or more importantly, or more specifically, the Jews have to keep. And that would, that would presuppose that there was an ability to keep them, right? You have to keep every one. So if you were trying to keep one, then you would think that you were adequate in yourself to do it, right? I mean, God has set the standard, so he must think we can do it. Well, what was happening is Paul is saying, look, in and of ourselves, we are inadequate. We cannot do what God wants us to do. We don't have the ability, we don't have the discipline, we don't have the strength, the mental determination to do it. So what do we do? We have to turn to Him. And so that's one of the things as we get in in a moment when we compare the two is the difference between the law and the Spirit. The law brings one thing, the Spirit brings another. And if we don't understand that, what's going to happen in our Christian life is we're going to be on that treadmill of performance. 
We're going to be trying to do and do and do so that God will be happy with us, so that God will accept us, so that God will be pleased with us. And yet, Paul says it is the Spirit that gives life, not the doing of the, of the old covenant. And so Paul brings that out. He's about to bring that out. Paul is declaring that the ministry of the new covenant, not the letter of the Spirit, is what's important. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So the second thing I want you to see here from this passage is that is Paul's comparison of the old and the new. I want to go back to verses 7 and 9 for a moment. It says, But if the ministry of death, which is the law, in letters engraved on stones, came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how would the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Now, why would Paul say that the ministry of the law is a ministry of death? Why would he say that? I mean, this is God's holy, righteous law. Why would he say that? Well, I think one of the reasons that he would say that is because the law is unrelenting. The law does not change. The law does not bend. The law does not do anything. The law kills. You, the, you run up against the law, you get hurt. The law does not change. You have to change in relation to them. The law shows unbelievers their sin. If God had not given us the law, we would not have known we needed a Savior, would we? How many of us would have known we would ever sin without, without the law? Paul said, I didn't know I was a coveter until I read, Thou shalt not covet. And he said, then all I wanted to do was covet. I couldn't stop myself. And that's what the law does. It excites and entices sin. The law is not sin, but the law entices sin. The more you focus on it, the more you do it. The more you will break it, I guess I should say, with the law. The law was never given to give life. The law cannot give life. All the law can do is point you to the one who can. All the law can do is show you that you need someone greater than yourself to give you something that you can't attain by yourself, that you need Jesus Christ. But he says there was glory in it because it came from God to Moses. So the law possessed glory. It still possesses glory. The law has not done, been done away with. It's still there. It's still there for those who are unbelievers. But he says there's more glory in grace. There's more glory in in grace. For those of you who are in grace, who have trusted Christ, then there's glory in what Christ has done for you. It's not in keeping something, it's in receiving something. And that something is Jesus Christ. He says the ministry of the law is condemnation. It was ultimately given to point us to the Messiah, to the one who was to come, to Jesus the Christ, the God-man, the one who came from heaven to be with us, to live and to die and to be raised again so that we could have life. And in that condemnation, you know what Paul said in Romans 8? He says there's no condemnation in Christ. Why? Because Christ was the one who came from the Father to bring about our salvation, to bring about our rightness with God. And what's the word we use? Propitiation. Thank you. Because of that, we now have, have faith with God. Now we are right with God. And in verse 10, he declared that what once had glory, the law, has no glory at all. So if, the, if what once had glory, the law, the 613 or the 10, however you want to look at it, had glory, but it doesn't anymore, and something has come that has more glory, which is Jesus Christ and the grace that he offers us, why is it that so many people get upset when either me or some other preacher preaches the message of grace over the message of law? I think there is, there is a, a concerted effort from sincere people to try to give us a balance of law and grace. And that is because the law is in the Scripture and because grace is in the Scripture, we have to do them both. We have to obey them both. We have to, we have to keep the law as best we can. In fact, some would say the Spirit was given to us so that we could keep the law. So it, we've got to have a mix. But what happens when we try to mix the two? It's like trying to run, it's like hamstringing a, an animal who's trying to run. 
They can't do it. They kept, keep falling down. And it's the same with us. It's like putting shackles on your feet and trying to run a marathon. Every step, you're, you're catching it. Every step. And it just wears you out because you cannot do it. Grace did not come to partner with law. Grace came to supersede it. The old covenant was given so that you will know you're a sinner. Once you know you're a sinner and recognize your need for a Savior, then you accept what Christ gave you by grace, and then you move on. The law stays here, and you move on this way in the rest of your life. The law will condemn you. The law will tell you how horrible a sinner you are. Grace says you have a Savior who did it all for you. Put your trust in Him, and now you have a new heart. You have a new spirit, a new life. Now, one of the things, though, when He came into us, He gives us a new heart. He doesn't change our brain. You know, we still do stupid things. I do. I won't speak for you. I won't speak for you stupid people. But for me, it, it, I do. All right? But it's, but it's not what I want to do, necessarily. But it's because I live in this flesh. The Spirit is always there prompting me not to is always there encouraging me not to sin. You know, some people say if you only preach grace and not law, then you're giving people a license to sin. You're telling them it's okay. But here's the thing. When you are saved, the Spirit of the living God comes to live in you. He doesn't stand beside you. He doesn't live around you. He lives in you. The Spirit of the living God will never cause you or promote or push you toward sin. So we don't need something written on stone to tell us how to live. We simply need to be obedient to the Spirit who lives inside of us. And that Spirit will never lead us down a wrong road. And that's why Paul said the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now we are free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is is liberty. We are free to live for Him. From now on, we're not, we don't have to go back and look for a rule. We simply live according to the Spirit that lives within us. And we live in freedom, not bondage. So a third thing is, what is our response to the law then? Well, first of all, we need to read it and we need to know it. You should study Leviticus. You should study Exodus. Study it. Understand it. Know it. Understand why God gave it. The law is perfect. The law is perfect and it does exactly what it was intended to do. It is to push people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Without it, people would have no standard of which to, to look at themselves. The law is perfect and holy and pure. We're told to be perfect, holy, and pure. We can't do it. We need a Savior. So if we don't know about the Savior, then we are left condemned. We're left hopeless. But when we understand the law is telling us who we are and what we are, then Grace says, but here's the solution. The answer to your dilemma is Jesus Christ. Then we move away from the law and we move to Jesus Christ and we live. But here's the thing. We don't revere the law and we don't worship it. The law is never meant to be worshipped. It becomes an idol when you worship it. It becomes an idol when you overemphasize it because then all your focus is on something that God has given rather than upon God himself. And that's always idolatry. It had a place for us while we were lost in sin. Now that the Spirit has made us alive in Himself, we leave it behind because it's no longer necessary for us. And look what he said in verse 18. But we, we all, with unveiled faces, the law veiled the face, the Spirit unveils, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. The law veils, is veiled because it is only a picture. It is only pointing. It's not the main thing. What is the main thing is the unveiled Spirit of Jesus Christ. It is what we have through Him. But we are being transformed daily into the image of Jesus Christ by Spirit. Moment by moment, as we yield to the Spirit, as we listen to the Spirit, as we follow the promptings of the Spirit, as we walk in the Spirit and we recognize the freedom we have in the Spirit and the life we have in the Spirit and all of the things that go with it, the fruit of the Spirit, then we begin to, to become the image of Jesus Christ. We don't have to work for it. We can't earn it. We can't make it happen. 
It is by complete dependence and yielding our lives to Him. Some would say surrender. As we surrender to Him, then He, become, he begins to make us into His image. It's incredible. We don't have to do it. Only He does it. Now, let's go back to the three questions. Was your faith life once vibrant, but now is it on that treadmill? You can't find that off button? Do you struggle with feelings of guilt because you can't really get there in your spiritual life because you're trying hard every day? Do you question your salvation because you can't follow a formula? Well, you see, a formula is nothing more than a rule. It's a law, and we don't live under the law. The Christian life is not lived by a formula. It is lived by the Spirit of the living God. So I want to encourage you today is rely upon Him not your efforts. Trust in the leading of the Spirit. You will not grow in grace until you allow the Spirit to transform you. The more you work at it to try to transform yourself, the more you're going to be running in quicksand. You're not going to get anywhere. It is not by human effort. It is by the Spirit of the living God who lives in us. Then what's going to happen as you let the Spirit begin to take control of you you're going to see you never wonder about that deeper Christian life because you're in it. You're already there. And the Lord has taken you deeper into your understanding and your realization of Him in your life. It's not about you digging down hard enough to get it because we don't know where to dig. But it's the Spirit changing us, molding us, transforming us into His image day by day, moment by moment, experience by experience. That how, how, that's how it comes. It doesn't... It isn't done by anything that you and I can do. No matter how sincere and no matter how diligent we try, sincerity and diligence do not spiritual maturity make. Spiritual maturity comes as you live to the, in the Spirit and you recognize that you are free to live with Him. If the, the Son has set you free, what does John say? You are free indeed. So don't put yourself, as Paul said elsewhere, don't let yourself be bound again to the slavery. Slavery is to the law, but live in freedom. Don't put the shackles back on you. Jesus took them off. Jesus says, live in my grace, live free in my spirit, and follow where I lead. And then we will not have to worry about, are we spinning our wheels? Are we burning out? Are we struggling with, does Jesus love me or not? None of those questions will be our questions because we know without a shadow of a doubt that we are His, we are safe, we are secure, and we are loved, and nothing can ever change that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Paul's clear message to us. He isn't denigrating Your law. He isn't putting it down. He isn't saying it's worthless, and neither am I. Your law is perfect. It, uh, it has done for each of us in here who have experienced your grace exactly what it was intended to do. But now we no longer need a tutor. We no longer need a schoolmaster. We need to live free by your Spirit. And thanks be to God that at the moment of conversion you put your Spirit within us so that we now have your life in us and that we are made new. We are new creations and we can live from our newness of heart and that you will renew our minds. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your grace that you've given out to us, that you've poured out lavishly upon us. We thank you that we can put our shovels down. We can put our pickaxes down. We can quit working so hard. We can simply rest in you and allow you to work through us as we love and care for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.